What's up there guys? Thanks for tuning in, this is Rick. You're watching Fanfare for the Conscious. In the video today, we're going to be talking about the nature of God, the God of nature, and the God of man. Let's dive in. Now there's a few of you who are probably wondering what on earth this has in terms of relevance to what's going on in the world at the moment. Um, but I'm going to explain to you just firstly exactly why I think this is important knowledge to have. So the separation of God from man has been one of the very fundamental pressures which has allowed the system that we're currently a part of to take us away from common and natural law because common and natural law is tied to the idea of an intelligent system, tied to the idea of there being a fundamental living intelligence in nature itself. So we're going to consider this, these ideas. We're going to have to first start with understanding what the nature of God is. So a God is a being which is omniscient, is omnipotent and is omnipresent. Now we're going to define those three terms so we can start to understand what a true God really, really is. So omniscient means all seeing and all knowing. That means they, that an omniscient God would know everything about the universe. It would be able to perceive the cycles of cause and effect. It would be able to understand chaos itself and recognise how one event leads to another and impacts a myriad of other events to determine exactly what's going to happen. So not only does it have current knowledge of the universe in existence as it is, but has, under, has a recognition of how previous events have led to the place where it is now and how events will play out in the future. Now that's an important point because we're going to come back to that a little bit later when we start discussing the God of man and why I believe the God of man is not a true God. The next one we come down to is omnipotent, which means all powerful. That means that there is nothing beyond the ability of a God. There's absolutely nothing that a God cannot do. Very, very simple. Very, very simple. Power is infinite. And the last one we get down to is omnipresent. And that simply means that God is everywhere, at all times, in all places, in every dimension, every realm, there is nothing that exists outside of God. If there's anything that exists outside of the God that you've defined, then they are not a God, because they are not omniscient. A God has to be an entity above, beyond, and a part of all that exists. If the God doesn't fulfill those three characteristics, then there is a superior, more knowledgeable and more powerful entity in existence. So that describes the nature of God. Second thing we're going to come on to is the God of nature, which I believe is, is the true understanding of what God really is. So the God of nature is the ghost in the machine. It is the innate intelligence of nature and it is emergent. It is self-regulating, it is self-perpetuating and it is self-organising. A really good area of study with regards to this is to do some reading around swarm intelligence and multi-agent processing. Now you'll find some of this mixture between natural science and computer science. The swarm intelligence side will cover things like herding behaviour, flocking behaviour um, and colony systems of um, organisation, ants, termites, social insects, things like that. Um, whereas the multi-agent processing is a computer, it's a method of processing information and a method of sorting data in order to 
do things that classical computation can't normally do. Um, a, a great example of multi-agent processing in action is the traveling salesman problem. Um, anybody who's done anything in, in computer science will understand this is a very fundamental problem for um, intelligent systems and traditional programming does not handle this idea of the traveling salesman very well. So the God of nature is actually provable in science. We, we see examples of the God of nature all the time. And we find it in the form of equations. Now, there was no human being that designed those equations and then tested them to see if they produced the universe. The equations that we're talking about here are equations that have come from the observation of the universe, which implies an innate intelligence. They were not developed, these equations were not developed by humanity, by intelligent corporeal beings. They were already existent in the system and they were simply discovered and recognised by sovereign intelligent living beings. And that points to an innate intelligence of nature. It is a self-organising and self-regulating system. So we, for this, you can look at the relationship between predator and prey. The relationship between predator and prey is this constant oscillation, um, an undulation between the prey um, populations rising, which then provides more food for the predators, so the predators kill more prey, and then the prey population starts to decline. As the prey population starts to decline, now the predators don't have enough food, and they either don't have as many children or the children do not survive and therefore the predator population drops and you get this constant regulation, this um, oscillation which produces um, an overall state of balance. If you average it all out there is a, a sort of a mean value at which the universe operates. It is self-perpetuating so life creates life and continues to create life. It's, it's cyclical. The whole process repeats over and over again. So in that sense, it is self-perpetuating. It's almost alive in itself. Uh, and the final thing about nature, let's say, it is self-organizing. Um, we're going to touch a little bit on Darwinism here, but the rules that are in place in the universe that are intrinsic to nature itself create a system by which niches are filled and life finds a way to expand and um, assert itself wherever it can find a foothold in order to do so. So that creates the sort of self-organisation. Species which fulfil a given role well will survive and will thrive and species that do not fulfil a given um, role particularly well will either have to move on to another role, another niche or will necessarily suffer. So adaptability is the key here, and that adaptability is emergent in the system itself. When you start to take a step back and have a look at all these systems which were not designed by man but merely discovered by them, you start to recognise that innate, emergent intelligence of nature and the universe itself. So finally now we come on to the God of man. Now, the God of man is not omniscient. It's claimed to be omniscient, but he's not omniscient. You just need to look in the religious texts. Now, I don't believe they originally described the God of nature. I believe they, they have been um, co-opted and manipulated and twisted and misinterpreted in order to separate us from God. In the God of nature, we are an intrinsic part of this system. We are an intrinsic part of this intelligence. We are a piece of God itself. The God of man separates us from it. It says that we are born into sin, that we are evil beings and we have to work in order to return to God. So he's definitely not omniscient because he makes mistakes. You just need to look at the flood. God made his creation and he was unhappy with it. If he's omniscient, if he sees all and he knows all, she, it, sees or knows all, then how can he ever be unhappy with his creation? He created it knowing full well exactly how events would play out based on, on what was brought into being. 
So he can't be disappointed with us. He can't have made a mistake. And that necessarily eliminates, starts to eliminate the idea of this um, impersonal God that is not a part of us being a God in itself. The second one, they are not omnipotent. He's not omnipotent. We just need to talk about the idea of the fallen angels. There was a, a civil war in heaven. Now, how that could be of any great surprise to an omniscient or seeing all knowing God, how he could have been tricked or deceived by his supposed brother is, is just completely nonsensical. And if he truly is omnipotent, then he would have power over those entities anyway. So therefore not omnipotent. Final point about the God of man, he is not omnipresent. There are domains beyond God. People in a lot of mainstream religions would describe somebody who didn't follow their religion as godless. They have not brought and accepted God into their hearts or their souls or however you want or into their lives, however you wish to describe it. Now that necessarily creates a separation between man, the living corporeal entity and God the ethereal um, creator of the universe and watcher of all. If you have to invite God into your heart and into your soul and into your life, then he is not omnipresent. There is a domain beyond God. The same with the idea of hell and purgatory. These are all domains considered to be beyond the realm of God, to be part of the realm of the devil. If we're really trying to talk about the idea of the God of man, we have to accept God and the devil being um, different faces of the same entity in the same way that the Hindus have multiple gods. They are just faces of, of the same whole. The last point that's always struggled, uh, I've always struggled with about the God of man, the God of human religion, is the free will incompatibility with omniscience. A lot of these religions talk about needing to be saved. And again, we come back to this omniscience, this all seeing, this all knowing. When God, the God of man, creates a person who is to, uh, who is to grow up to be a sinner and is to grow up to reject the idea of God, God knows that when he's created them. If he doesn't know that, if he isn't aware, fully aware of all the choices that that living being is going to make over the course of its life, then he's not all seeing and he's all not, not all knowing. And that completely takes away the idea of redemption because God has created a sinner to be a sinner. So that brings me just to the end of my little brainstorm around my feelings around what God is and what God isn't. And I, I firmly sit in this camp. I could go into a lot more detail about the true nature of God and the God of nature himself. But these are the primary points that we have to bear in mind. If we want to consider God, we have to apply these three concepts to God. Otherwise, he ceases to be a God. For me, God is that innate intelligence, that emergent feedback that we see in the universe, whereby the universe is always taking its own temperature and then adjusting to regulate that in the same way that you turn the heat up and down on your stove as your food starts to get too hot or doesn't cook you know, as quick as you'd like it. It's this constant check and reevaluate and adjust and check and reevaluate and adjust. Uh, and this can be seen in resonance field physics, which I will talk about in a later time. In the meantime, if you want to check that out, look for Nassim Haramain on YouTube um, and his Schwarzschild Proton um, Unified Field Theory. Really, really interesting man. He's at a website called resonance.is. Resonance is. Really, really interesting. Um, anyway, I'm going to cut this off here because I could go on for hours and hours about this and I don't want to confuse you any more than I possibly already have. Things to remember. The nature of God is he has to be omniscient. He has to be all seeing and all knowing. God has to be omnipotent. He has to be all powerful. Nothing is outside of his remit. Omniscience, uh, sorry, om omnipresence 
God has to be omnipresent. He has to be everywhere. There cannot be any domains that are outside of him. If they are, then he is not the ultimate God, the ultimate intelligence. Which for me, completely negates the idea of the God of the man. The God of man is fallible. The God of man is not all powerful. There are creatures that are at least equal in power to him. And there are domains beyond the power of the God of man. So the only true way to really understand God here is to recognize God as being the whole of the universe itself. Everything that you could ever imagine God to be. Every dimension, every alternative reality, every parallel reality, it all has to be contained under this umbrella of God. Because if there is anything outside it, then he is not omnipresent anymore. If there is anything more powerful than him, then he is not omnipotent anymore. And if there is anything beyond his knowledge and beyond his eye, then he is no longer omniscient. You got through to the end of the video. Thank you very much for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to see more content just like this, don't forget to like and subscribe, share the video around. If you're an American and you want to free yourselves from slavery right now, go and check out AnnaVonRights.com, the American States Assembly.net, and AmericaUnincorporated.org. If you want to discuss with me any of these subjects that I've covered here, or want to be part of the awakening of humanity and the building of a brand new system that we can all exist within and achieve our goals, then go and join lawfulbank.com. Take care of yourselves, stay free, and I'll see you next time.